officially today is being observed as Transfiguration Sunday. Now, I believe that some denominations have other dates for Transfiguration Sunday, and some of them call it with a different name. They call it the Feast of Transfiguration. But nevertheless, I think this highlights the importance of uh, this very unusual event that took place in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, this story is preserved in all the three Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, now, the word transfiguration, of course, if you look at the Latin root of the word trans and figura, it signifies a change of form or appearance. And we know through the story that Jesus, uh, even as he took the disciples up to the mountain uh, where he was praying, suddenly went through this most unusual situation where he was transfigured. His appearance changed. And of course, as we read, the disciples were frightened. Let's explore this story together and let us see how it speaks to the larger story of God himself and how it speaks to us personally. So to understand this story, we need to see the context in which it is placed. And so uh, I'm not sure if it is coming up on the screen. Uh, So the context, for the context, we need to go to the previous chapter. Uh, and that is Mark chapter 8. I'm not sure if this works, but uh, let me see if it does. Uh, okay, well, as uh, those scriptures come up on the screen, in the book of Mark chapter 8, one chapter previous to what where, where we read the story, if, uh, you, know, you might remember that Mark 8 contains Peter declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. If you remember, uh, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And through that conversation, Peter is the one who declares Jesus is the Messiah. Now, though, the, though Peter and the disciples declared Jesus as the Messiah, they probably did not fully recognize uh, the full gamut of what they were really trying to say. Uh, to some extent, they may have underestimated Jesus' true identity. If you notice the second point there, Jesus predicts his death. That's also in Mark chapter 8. Just after that conversation about who Jesus was, then Jesus says he has to die. And of course, uh, Peter is not very amused by what, Peter, uh, what uh, Jesus says. They were not ready to accept Jesus would actually be put to death. I was quite, they were quite surprised. And Peter even went to the extent of opposing Jesus and saying, no master, that cannot happen. Right? And of course, Jesus uses some very sharp words and where he says, get thee behind me, uh, Satan. In other words, Peter's declaration was not of God. What Jesus want, was helping them understand is that he was not going to lose his life. But he was going to give his life for all humanity. That's a big difference. Nobody has the power to take life from Jesus because he is life himself. But he was going to give his life for all humanity. And finally, in Mark chapter 8, looking at the context, Jesus then says, talks about the way of the cross. Pick up your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. Jesus was helping them understand 
There are going to be difficult times. If you're going to be my disciple, it's not going to be an easy ride. There will be persecution. There will be uh, various other, you know, uh, hurdles that they may have to encounter. And hope and as we move into Mark chapter 9, this was, this story was probably, you know, Jesus used to encourage them that even though they would have difficulty, uh, you know, they can continue to maintain their faith. Let me see if this works. Otherwise, Praveen, can you put the next uh, thing on the screen there? Now we come to Mark chapter 9. And... Uh, the, we started reading from verse 2, but let us look at verse 1. Uh, he said to them, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. All right. Uh, very interesting words that is used by Jesus in Mark chapter 9 verse 1, where he says, some are standing here who will not taste death, right? Now, Mark, uh, notice Jesus says, uh, the kingdom will come in power and some will have the opportunity to see it. Now, this is normally, when we talk about the kingdom, we normally associate with the second coming of Jesus. That is when the fullness of the kingdom is going to be established. Uh, and because of that, some people thought, oh, the kingdom is going to come in our own lifetime. Some of the disciples thought that Jesus would come back, you know, in their own lifetime. But now we know, as we continue to read in Mark 9, that he was actually referring to the event of the transfiguration. That... Those three disciples who were standing there will get a glimpse of the kingdom through this very special manifestation. They will be able to see the kingdom uh, in a very special way. Uh, so, having said that, let's study the transfiguration itself. All right. Uh, in verse, let's pick up in verse 3. Notice it says, his clothes became dazzling white. Whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. <laughs> it's a very interesting choice of words. Uh, you know, the author here, Mark, was trying to describe something which is indescribable. You know? He was strugg struggling to uh, capture through words something that is so very difficult for, you know, to be able to portray by mere words. And so he says, whiter than anyone in the world. But this dazzling white, blinding whiteness, blinding light, is a, a very interesting phenomenon we read in the scriptures, right? And we have, and you know, several times, people have had these experiences. And... Obviously, it was an evidence of this, that it was supernatural. If you remember Stephen, uh, as the church began, you remember he uh, was one of those who preached very mightily. But unfortunately, he was uh, stoned to death. But just before he was being, uh, you know, the, as he was being stoned to death, just, just before he lost his life, but Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, we read about that, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to the heaven and saw the glory of God. That's interesting. The glory of God. Is this describing the glory of God? You know, this blinding light, this brightness is probably the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So we have this interesting uh, event taking place in the life of uh, Stephen. If you remember Paul on his conversion, on the journey where he was converted in Acts, recorded for us in Acts chapter 9, the scripture says as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven. Once again, you have this thing about this light, this whiteness. 
uh, it says a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus who you are persecuting. So Jesus identifies himself through this event where uh, Paul is struck. Uh, actually, he's, he's, he's struck down because of the sudden bright light that he was witnessing. And one more, John himself, who was one of the disciples who actually was there at the transfiguration. John writes in Revelation chapter 1, another event where he sees the glory of God, where he says, describing what he's seeing in vision, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters, his face was like the sun, shining at all its brilliance. Notice that? Face shining in like the sun in all its brilliance. So this is probably how God decided to reveal his glory uh, to our physical eyes. And these three disciples saw this suddenly Jesus, you know, in, immersed in this whiteness, in this bright light. And could it be, as we have, if you go to the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory, you know, mentioned in the book of Exodus, where it says, uh, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the Lord's glory filled the tabernacle. And the cloud was necessary because it had to protect people. People couldn't fully uh, be, was, was not in a position to absorb that kind of presence of the Lord. So the Lord's glory filled the tabernacle. I say this because it's very interesting, this, uh, uh, this series of events we read in the Bible about this white light, brightness. I was, uh, I was uh, you know, looking at some videos and uh, I don't know if you have come across this, but I've heard that uh, in the country of Iran, there are many turning to Christ. Many are beginning to recognize Jesus Christ as their savior. And one of the things that has been common in the conversion of some of these people is some of them have witnessed this bright light. Uh, I can't explain it. Uh, maybe it is pure speculation on my part. But those who claim to have had an encounter, a special encounter. Now, I haven't had it. I don't know if any of you had it. But if, but is it possible that those who had a special encounter with Jesus tell the same story? The same story of this brightness. And it is unmistakable. It is Jesus. They say, I saw Jesus. Now, once again, I, I leave it, you know, for further understanding about that. But uh, I thought it's a very interesting phenomenon that God decides to shine his glory to these three disciples. And he says they are going to see the kingdom before they die. And, uh, and some people are seeing it today. So let's move on with the story. What happens next as they are now encountered by this bright light? Uh, let's read on, I think in verse 4 it says, And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And there is a clarification by the author Mark. He says he did not know what to say. Uh, they were so frightened. And Peter, of course, uh, always has, uh, takes the opportunity to speak first. So he blurts out, you know, can we put these three tents? Now, first and foremost, here you have Elijah and Moses. Once again, we, Mark does not give details. We don't know exactly how the manifestation took place. Uh, were they, I mean, uh, it was a vision or... We don't know. I mean, we, we don't want to speculate. But Elijah and Moses, what is the significance of Elijah and Moses? We know that Moses represents the law. It is through him the law was given. 
Elijah represented the prophets. He was called one of the greatest prophets in Israel. So, Eli Moses the law, Elijah the prophets, the law and the prophets. You remember that? The law and the prophets are all represented by Moses and Elijah. For what reason? They were pointing forward to the Messiah. They were there to basically perhaps confirm that the sum total of scripture, which is the law and the prophets, from beginning to end, is all pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. And right there before their eyes, these disciples recognized, yes, the Messiah indeed has come. Now, uh, three tenths. Peter says three tenths. Now, there was a belief in Peter's time, which I'm sure came across from the Old Testament times, uh, that divine beings dwelt in tabernacles or tents. And so that is why Peter says, uh, why don't we build three tents, you know, because this is divinity. And they, they, obviously it was very clear to them, this has to be divine. And so let's put three tents there. You know, and that's what everybody's been doing after that, right? They are always trying to house God in a, in a physical place. <laughs> but God is, you know, his glory is so much more greater than any one small little place. He is everywhere, right? Um, but another issue that we can pick up from this conversation is Peter was inadvertently putting Elijah and Moses on the same level of Jesus. Right. Perhaps he saw Christ uh, as a great prophet like Moses and Elijah, and certainly he was a great prophet. But Jesus is much more than Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses were there testifying to the glory of uh, Christ. And so Peter made the mistake of thinking that, oh, Christ is just like Elijah and Moses and certainly not. Christ is far above them. Later, Peter realizes that. And if I can just read you a scripture from 2 Peter, when, when he writes his epistle. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when, they, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So this takes place on the mount. So Peter is referring to this in his epistle and declaring, yes, we saw the glory of God. And the glory of God is Jesus Christ himself, right? And so his faith obviously began to continue to grow by the time he wrote the epistle. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the story. Okay, and then it goes on to say, Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Now, once again, you have the cloud, you know, just like in the... Uh, in the uh, Old Testament, the cloud came and covered. Uh, so maybe it was, like I said, to shield them, protect them uh, because of the, you know, the uh, very uh, sometimes, you know, intense presence of the Lord in the Shekinah glory. Maybe there was that cloud cover that they needed. But interestingly enough, notice what happens. This is my son. The voice cries out. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is my son. When you talk about son, what must you, uh, what must you assume? There is a father. Right? Automatically points to a father. If there is a son, there has to be a father. Uh, and... Where the son and the father is, who else is there? The Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit proceeds from the father. 
And another occasion it says it proceeds from the Son. The Trinitarian revelation. Right? It reveals the communion of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. All there for them to recognize. What does this mean though? Remember Jesus said. Some will see the power of the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God. Is nothing more but a communion. A communion which points to a relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And a union and the fact that they are one. So they are seeing the kingdom. Father, Son, Spirit. Uh, a theologian said. The heaven is the Holy Trinity. And I thought it was a very interesting way to put it. We all think heaven as some place in the galaxies with streets of gold. And yeah, I mean, you can, you can use those words as biblical words. But heaven primarily is the Holy Trinity. Right? And what Jesus and what is happening here is we have, you know, it is a communication to them. And of course, to all of us today that we have been accepted invited and given residence within the communion the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is nothing more but the communion of the father son spirit okay what happens next suddenly when they looked around they no longer saw anyone with them except jesus everything disappears all of a sudden moses elijah even the cloud fades away only Jesus is left. Does that say something to us? Perhaps it tells us. That is all we need. All we need. Is Jesus Christ. Our Lord. He is the perfect mediator. He is the bridge between God and humanity. He is the center of the center. All we need is the son. Jesus Christ our Lord. Perhaps these are some thoughts we can entertain as we read through that and today. Wonderfully that we can be together on Transfiguration Sunday. So let's look at some applications for us from the thoughts that I picked out of that uh, story. Uh, uh, you know, one, we certainly understand and know through the story. It has been revealed to us. It's a revelation of the uniqueness of Jesus and indeed the divinity of Jesus, right? Uh, he is, Jesus is not from here, <laughs> in other words, uh, but he made himself one of us and he took on humanity and thus, but we are now understanding that Jesus' divinity is beyond doubt, beyond doubt. And gives us the confidence to worship him. So that is one thought that we can entertain. An application we can make. Jesus uniqueness. His divinity. And the fact that we can worship him. Because he is uh, divine. Secondly, another revelation that we can glean from. And an application we can make. Revelation of God's love for humanity. <clears throat> As we were just discussing, the kingdom is the person of the Father, Son, Spirit to whom we have an invitation. We are being invited by the Father, Son, Spirit. Right? Um, God's love is seen in the uniqueness of this invitation into the kingdom. We are, they are being said, they are being told, you will have a glimpse of the kingdom. For what reason? Because... They are being told about the kingdom because they were invited into that kingdom. Right? Into the very abode of the Father, Son, Spirit. The kingdom, as you can see on the right, the picture, is basically grace, love, and fellowship. 
right? And that is the benediction that we use so often. That's the kingdom. The benediction is actually the kingdom, you know, personified in Jesus. And we are invited to it. And finally, a third uh, application, applicative thought we can uh, take out of there is the consolation. In the twin revelation of the uniqueness of Jesus and the kingdom, we also receive a consolation that uh, death is not the end. Right. Uh, just as Jesus was glorified, we will also be glorified. They were being remember, they saw Jesus in that brightness. They are trying. They were they were uh, being told that Jesus will give his life. But his real, you know, presence is that glory in which he lives. So in other words, death has no power over him and he has defeated death. So maybe a consolation for all of us that. Suffering will end. We can look forward to a glory that is beyond description and, and imagination. Maybe some of us are going through tough times. And sometimes it, it affects our faith. We have many questions as to why some things happen. And I question God on a daily basis. Every time there is so many, so much, uh, you know, hardship and difficulty we see around us. But maybe... This revelation of the kingdom can help us recognize that our faith does not need to fail because there is something beyond the suffering. There is something beyond this physical life. Uh, so let us see the kingdom through the eyes of these disciples and the authors that have written the scriptures. That there is, beyond, there is something beyond suffering and death. And of course, and that is the glory of the kingdom. So... Brother, may we be encouraged by this revelation and the consolation we can receive through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now Jesus invites you to come to him. And that is why we do the communion, don't we? He invites you to the communion of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the kingdom of God, shown to us in that very small glimpse of the glory. That was revealed. And so we can come with gratitude. We can come with confidence. And partake of Jesus. Through the symbols of the bread and wine. So what I'll do now is. Uh, I will. Uh, pray for the elements. So if. Uh, some of you can help. Take away the cover from the two tables. Uh, let us reveal the bread and the wine. And. Uh, let me bring the elements with me as I pray before we partake. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you very much that today we can present ourselves as we have come to call it Transfiguration Sunday. And what a story, Father. What uh, an event that you have inspired to pre be preserved in the scriptures that reveals to us who indeed Jesus is. And more than that, it indeed reveals what is the kingdom. It is the communion of the Father, Son and Spirit into which we are being invited to have a part to be able to enjoy that communion for all eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for inviting us into your kingdom. Thank you for showing us a glimpse of it through the eyes of the apostles. And today we want to once again renew our faith in you, Lord Jesus, even as you have given this bread, which symbolizes your body broken for us. And the wine symbolizing the blood that you shed for us. And. We are reminded that you came to give your life. Nobody could take it from him, but he voluntarily gave his life. So that, Father, we might have life. And so bless this bread and this wine as a symbol of the body and the blood of Jesus. And even as we partake, indeed, we are partaking of Christ himself, uh, who empowers us into life forevermore. 
looking forward to the fullness of the kingdom when Jesus comes again a second time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you can take your elements and go back, let us partake of it together. Please come forward wherever you are close by to a table. Please come and take the wine and bread. Those of you who would like to participate. Jesus has given us life and indeed life forevermore. 